So thank you um, for all being here for the presentation and discussion number six with uh, David. David holds the eminent position of being the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority, um, known mostly as ACARA. It's the most important and influential position. Um, I don't know whether to say that's a wonderful position, congratulations, or David, have you taken up your cross and borne it? Because education in this country is the subject of much controversy, um, angst, and politicians on all sides, all of whom are exercising their expertise. So God bless you. David's attention, uh, sorry, David's attention. David's paper is on Pay Attention, Simone Weil and Bernard Lonigan in Dialogue on the Role of Attention in Education, Implications for the Next National School Reform Agreement. Please all welcome David. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, what I'm going to do today, and I think I said I gave an indication of this to everybody yesterday, is I'm not going to um, stick closely to the, the paper that I've um, provided. The point of providing it ahead of time was precisely so that people could read it and then think about how the ideas and content in that imaginary dialogue um, could be um, brought into uh, what I was going to do today, which is um, as per the first slide, focus on some of the practical um, uh, issues that uh, we're facing in Australian education today. I did want to say, of course, uh, at the start that Jeff and I did not um, collude at all um, in the preparation of our papers. And so, but nevertheless, I find um, there are a number of touch points between what he had to say and what I've said in my paper and what I intend to say today. And in particular, I just like to. Um, maybe um, read the first couple of paras of the paper. Um, of course, uh, plagiarism from Monty Python in the very first line, good afternoon, Father Lonigan, why are you today? Um, to which he replies, good afternoon to you, Miss Vay. Why am I? Well, now let me see, or should I say, let me do more than just take a look, but rather attend to the data of my experience, asking intelligent questions and evaluating the possible answers so as to judge reasonably which of them I should affirm as being most likely. She says, how exhausting, how long will that take? Which he replies, all done, or rather should I say already done, as I can draw on the communal tradition into which I have been born to affirm the answer to the question, rather than having to conduct the analysis myself from scratch, I have appropriated that tradition for myself and can affirm that I am today for the same reason I was yesterday and will be tomorrow, namely because I am loved. So, and I think that was the point, uh, a lot of the point of what uh, behind Jeff was saying and uh, and that theme of love will be um, throughout um, my presentation, not necessarily up front, but in the background as we'll see as we progress along. So a um, bit of background um, first on uh, our organisation and the current, some of the current issues and debates um, in the Australian education, school education environment at the moment. I hope this uh, that goes on to the next slide. I've got to find a way of yep, doing that. So what I'm doing here is um, Nothing neat, so um, well packaged together as Jeff's paper. It is a loose set of loosely connected observations, provocations, questions, and challenges, but not much answers. So, a bit of background on ACARA. Um, these are from our, our, our website, essentially. Um, we are uh, a body that uh, provides authoritative advice on and the delivery of the national curriculum, assessment and reporting for uh, education ministers. So, we're accountable to all nine ministers, not just the federal minister. Uh, and uh, we aim to inspire improvement in the learning of all young Australians through world-class curriculum assessment and reporting. Apart from the Australian curriculum, we're probably most well known for NAPLAN, the National Assessment Program for Literacy and Numeracy, um, which uh, for the first time this year was conducted in March uh, instead of May. Um, we are an independent statutory authority, but of course we our, our authorising environment is very complex. Um, 
and we have to ensure uh, that uh, uh, a bit like uh, the papacy has to exercise its authority in a collegial way. So uh, that um, puts some interesting constraints on, on the way we go about our work. D David, um, um, yeah. We uh, to, for us to see the slides, you need to share them from your end. Uh, I you have been screen? sharing. It says you are screen sharing. Oh, okay. I've got a, it says you are screen sharing. Okay. Is that not coming up? That that would be it. Yes. Can you see them now? We can. Thank you so much. Okay. So good. So you've got a, a slide there that says the National School Reform Agreement, presumably, with a lovely photo of uh, the Minister Clare. Okay. So National School Reform Agreement is um, a four-year agreement. It's likely to turn into the next one's likely to be longer. It's an agreement between the Commonwealth and the states. It sets out a range of reciprocal and joint obligations for the delivery of a range of programs and initiatives intended to improve educational outcomes and the national goals of schooling. What are the national goals of schooling? So they are set out in a document called the Embarcha Education Declaration. Embarcha is the uh, uh, Arundel word for Alice Springs. Um, this declaration was signed by all ministers in 2019 in Alice Springs. Uh, and I wanted to zero on the, in on the second goal in particular, that all young Australians become confident and creative individuals, successful lifelong learners, and active and informed members of the community, um, which uh, are noble aspirations and, uh, in my view, don't always um, find, those aspirations don't always find expression in the in the way we actually go around go about schooling. And I think um, uh, Jeff touched on that in his, um, uh, and as I do in my paper, in my written paper, around um, an excessive focus on all things economic. Um, so move on. Um, so the Australian curriculum uh, has three dimensions. There's what you would expect, what the learning areas are, those traditional learning areas that most of people would be familiar with. Um, uh, English, mathematics, science, humanities and social science, which includes history, geography, economics, uh, the arts, uh, health and physical education, languages and technology. So they're the core of the curriculum, the eight learning areas. Then we have these, what we refer to, three cross-curriculum priorities. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures, Asia and Australia's engagement with Asia and sustainability. And then we have the seven general capabilities, uh, literacy, numeracy, digital literacy, critical and creative thinking, personal and social capability, intercultural understanding and ethical understanding. Now that sounds like a lot to get through, but... Uh, on the right hand side, it's important to note that the general capabilities and the cross curriculum priorities are not separate subjects. That's really important. They're not supposed to be taught separately. Instead, they're supposed to be um, teachers uh, are encouraged to find opportunities um, to incorporate those cross curriculum priorities and perspectives uh, and to uh, impart or develop those general capabilities through the teaching of the learning areas. And that's a really important a point to make because we often hear a lot about the crowded curriculum and uh, part of the recent review of the Australian curriculum was to make it clear that these cross-curriculum priorities and general capabilities are not separate subjects to be taught in addition to but are to be taught through if you like uh, the learning areas. So the general capabilities um, are I think are, are really important and interesting. The top three there are all uh, what we would you know easily associate with particular subjects such as English mathematics and and technologies the other four critical and creative thinking ethical understanding personal social capability intercultural understanding uh, are very much ones that I think um, the, the the work of Bernard Lonigan um, has a lot to say uh, about um, uh, and uh, it doesn't uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time in various talks that I've um, been giving, uh, are particularly around the critical and creative thinking aspect of that uh, and using uh, his approach to try and um, tease out and resolve some of the um, false dichotomies and uh, 
um, that are, are doing the rounds, uh, as Jeff said, often in a cyclical way through the education sector at the moment. Uh, I won't go into too much detail around that, but just to say that um, the, the general capabilities and thinking about them does provide plenty of opportunity for injecting um, Lonigan's thinking into, into the environment. Um, so the theme of the paper, as it was written, when I, when I originally started writing it, I was trying to deal with one of these particular um, dichotomies, which is around um, the quality of teaching, what the best way of teaching is. Um, and there is an increasing body of evidence that says there to support the argument that quality teaching has the, the most impact. Uh, and so there's been a lot of discussion and debate um, about what's the most effective and efficient approaches to teaching. This is mainly focused on um, reading. Um, you may have seen a lot of discussion around the synthetic phonics as an approach to the teaching of reading, particularly to young children. Uh, and then also mathematics and science are two other areas where there's been a lot of focus on pedagogical practice. Uh, um, so the uh, in the abstract for my paper and in the paper itself, I call attention to um, these two uh, approaches to, to teaching, which uh, are unfortunately becoming increasingly tribalized and seen as in opposition as opposed to complementary. And this is where I try to use Lonigan um, to, to get over uh, that, that false dichotomy in, uh, in what I talk to, to teachers about. So one of them is the inquiry learning and the other is called direct instruction. Um, essentially, direct instruction involves much more teacher-led um, instruction, teacher sort of laying out, here's the information. Um, Another way of uh, an image of sometimes putting it is the filling the pail, right? Here's my information. I've got a bucket of information. I'm going to pour it into your minds. And I do that through various techniques of direct instruction, uh, as opposed to um, uh, inquiry-based learning, which starts with the problem to be solved and often involves what is referred to in the, in the literature as productive struggle um, or the, the, Lonig the Lonigan um, equivalent, the tension of inquiry. Um, and unfortunately, these have become seen as increasingly sort of bifurcated as opposed to, uh, and in competition, as opposed to complementary. And I'm always trying in my various talks that I give to say, look, it's not one or the other. We, there is um, a time and a place for what we quite might call the, the way of heritage or the downward um, from above, um, the, 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 where the, the teacher is taking the lead uh, and uh, the way of achievement or the upward from below, uh, where we're really trying to um, start with where the students are, give them a problem to struggle with, uh, provide them with opportunities to, uh, to ask questions of their own uh, and build up their knowledge and understanding. Um, the way, you know, the, the hermeneutics is, if I can put it that way. Um, so there's equally some interesting debates around, well, what is meant by knowing? Uh, and a lot of people saying, well, it's all about knowledge. You know, you've got to be able to recall a body of facts. That's what, it's all about the facts. Very grad grindian um, view of education. Uh, that's often associated with the view that um, uh, direct instruction, it's all about the teacher imparting the information in such a way that the students can recall it. That's what makes, that's, uh, you know, what it's all about, according to one view. But um, it's also, um, uh, we need to think about knowing as a, a state of consciousness, more around understanding, so as to be able to apply that knowledge that is uh, in the long-term memory, uh, to be able to apply it in, in various contexts. Uh, and of course, in the moment of uh, the aha moment of insight, and I always say that's the thing that teachers really live for, as I'm sure Jeff would say, when they when they see the look on the face of the child, where they get it, um, uh, as Lonigan would say, they the, the teacher can, um, if you like, bring the horse to water, but they can't make them drink. They can provide hints and helps and scaffolds to lead the student to the point of, of understanding, but the, the student themselves has to, has to um, 
uh, experience that understanding for themselves and that's the mystery of insight mm -hmm. uh, but it's different it's not we're not saying that they have to do it by themselves the teacher is there to support them and, and herd them across if you like that the poems as an orum. okay so this is where i wanted to get to with um uh, lonigan and they i've just got some quotes there um they it strikes me i mean it's a very interesting person uh and uh i i her approach to uh, her pay, you know her, her reflections on school education uh, as being all about attention uh, for the purposes of developing the faculty of attention um I, again within a context of of, of prayer um, but I guess if I was to characterize uh, if I was to put her position into the current context I'd say that she she is saying the ability to pay attention is like another general capability uh, and in fact, the whole of education should be about developing those capabilities and particularly the capability of paying attention and the capability of paying attention to, to things that often people overlook. Um, and she has a particular focus on the afflicted and the people that um, uh, are get ignored in society. Uh, and so there's a real ethic of love there coming through that education is about uh, um, developing the capability or the capacity to pay attention to the things that need paying attention to. So for her, it's almost attention is like an outcome of the educative process. Uh, for Lonigan, on the other hand, uh, it seems to me that attentiveness and attention is a core um, starting point um, for the process, uh, the process of uh, gaining knowledge and understanding. Um, and uh, he makes the point um, that different from they, um, that the attention needs to be focused uh, if it's actually going to, to bear fruit. Um, and that is a slightly different emphasis uh, from what um, they uh, gives in her paper, in my view. Uh, and it comes back to well, how do we focus um, our innate desire to know uh, in such a way as to ask relevant questions of the data. Um, now, uh, at this point, I kind of want to, uh, I was developing the paper along these lines and um, I decided I wanted to take it in a slightly different direction um, for the for the purposes of today. So I was originally focused very much on this question of, you know, how to teach and pedagogy, you know, and the current debate around that. And I said, well, is, is that actually the big issue of the of the day is that the thing that we should be really focusing on or are there bigger issues um, that we need to kind of lift up our gaze uh, to think about the broader horizon if i can put it that way should we be thinking more about the what in the curriculum and the why uh, the purpose of education and all of those are, are interrelated um, so is there a bigger issue which educators haven't spotted because we haven't been paying attention or we've been paying attention uh, to to something that is you know in a very small part of the of the ecosystem so uh, coming back to the idea of the organ on for our times what is the character of our times what is our new cultural context what does this mean for education and this means that as educators and people I guess in my position and Jeff's position question is, well, what are we paying attention to? Um, how, how are we characterising uh, the character, our times when we look, when we take a look and we look hard at what's going on around us? And I do think there is one thing that has become increasingly obvious in recent uh, months that we need to pay more attention to. So here's some interesting sort of insights into what goes on in my brain. What have I been wondering about recently? I've been wondering, how does my car know when I turn it on that I want to go to work and how long it takes me? And when I go into the Amazon website, why do all the recommendations for Book on Lonigan come up? Um, and what have we learnt from the RoboDebt scandal when human beings surrendered decision-making about the recovery of welfare payments to algorithms? And how do we respond to those who say, we don't need to know stuff anymore, we'll just ask Google or ChatGPT. And anyone who's had a, an opportunity to play around with ChatGPT, the, 
capabilities of that um, generative uh, artificial intelligence are just extraordinary. And what do those advantages in artificial intelligence mean for the future of work, education, society and culture? And I think these issues are things that we probably need to be paying more attention to uh, and asking ourselves, what is the data of our experience with digital technology, with artificial intelligence, with social media, um, and asking the serious and big questions about this? Because this is now a key part of our cultural context, and I'm not sure that we've fully caught up with that. So, for example, returning back to the theme of attention, the significance of attention in the digital economy. Attention has now become a valuable commodity, being monetized by companies who seek to hold our attention for as long as possible. And with the rise of social media, streaming services, other digital platforms, attention is becoming a scarce, sellable and profitable resource. Uh, and the whole point of many of these digital platforms is to sell our attention uh, at a profit. Um, uh, and whenever we find it so convenient to go onto the Amazon bookstore, we are giving data about the things that we are interested in to a handful of um, global platforms. And is that really what we want to be doing? What are the long-term consequences of that? Um, in terms of social media and these new technologies, um, are they tools for connection or disconnection? Are they weapons of mass destruction? These are questions that are popping out from as I pay attention to these to these issues. Um, the new machine learning technologies are designed to push us further and further down our own rabbit holes. I go onto Amazon. I, I see Lonigan wall to wall <laughs> or Simone Bay. Um, uh, somebody else might go onto Amazon and, and find um, all all the books about you know why Donald Trump is you know the savior of the world, um, and we want to hear more of that. The booksellers are just interested in giving us more of what we want. Um, so our own individual interests are increasingly well catered for, and I go at the expense of common values and meanings, which is essential to a shared culture. They're becoming increasingly balkanized. Um, and using AI language models such as ChatGPT is, as I said, it's it's just extraordinary what that can do. Um, we're talking about mobile phone bans in schools for a whole lot of good reasons, I think. Um, but that's also raised um, a whole lot of questions. Interestingly, rates of self harm among teenage girls took off after the invention of the smartphone. Right? It's a it's it's not just a coincidence. Um, so if you look at that bottom line, um, this is from the Centre for Disease Control in the US. Um, after 2009, which is in the middle of the graph, the um, self-harm rates amongst 10 to 14 year old girls, very vulnerable and impressionable age, just took off. Um, is that really what we anticipated um, when we uh, invented these these tools? And how do we how do we um, regulate control for these things. Um, in addition to that, uh, this is a great book, you get a chance to grab it, um, The Death of Expertise and the Campaign Against Established Knowledge. Something, so Tom Nichols is a lead writer for The Atlantic. Um, something's going terribly wrong. The United States is now a country obsessed with the worship of its own ignorance. It's not just that people don't know a lot about science or geography, politics or geography. The bigger problem is that we're proud of not knowing things. The foundational knowledge of the average American is now so low that it's crashed through the floor of uninformed, past misinformed on the way down, is now plummeting to aggressively wrong. Um, people aren't necessarily interested, unfortunately, in finding out the facts and finding out the truth. They prefer to just accept and live inside the truth that makes sense to them. I actually think we're moving into an age where <clears throat> the unrestricted desire to know is actually becoming called into question. Is that actually a fact of human life anymore? This is a photo. I read that book um, uh, in um, when I was in Harvard. While I was there, the Charlottesville um, riots took place. This is a photo of the moment when um, 
the gentleman uh, driving the car at the back decided he was just going to ram his car into the crowd of people who he was politically opposed to. Um, and a young woman was killed as a result. This is the kind of social dislocation and social bifurcation and social dis, um, division that I think we're seeing more and more of. Uh, and it's just also being fueled um, to, by uh, our, some of our technologies. Um, what do we do about this? Um, just a few quotes from a great book, which I've just finished reading, uh, The Artificial Intelligence. In an age when machines increasingly perform tasks only humans used to be capable of, what then will constitute our identity as human beings? AI will expand what we know of reality. It will alter how we communicate, network, and share information. It will transform the doctrines and strategies we develop uh, and deploy. When people, when we are no longer um, exploring and shaping reality on our own, when we enlist AI as an adjunct to our perceptions and thoughts, how will we come to see ourselves and our role in the world? How will we reconcile um, AI, I should say, with concepts like human autonomy and dignity? One more. Um, from the same book. Uh, in an age in which reality can be predicted, approximated and simulated by an AI that can assess what is relevant to our lives, predict what will come next, decide what to do, the role of human reason will change. With it, our senses of our individual and societal purposes will change too. In some areas, AI may augment human reason. In others, it may prompt humans, um, uh, in humans, the feeling of being tangential to the primary process governing a situation, for the driver whose vehicle selects a different lane or route based on an unexplained or unspoken calculation, for the person who is extended or denied credit based on an AI facilitated review, for the job seeker who's asked to interview or not based on a similar process, for the scholar who is told the most likely answer by an AI model before his or her research has even begun. The experience may prove efficient, but not always fulfilling. The humans accustomed to agency, centrality, and monopoly on complex intelligence, AI will change our self-perception. So what does all this mean for education? I love Michael Looney. Um, on the one hand, we could argue, and I think this is true, absolutely, that the purpose of education is to equip our students with the ability to understand the society in which they're in. Here we have a gentleman, uh, a student, if you like, um, uh, looking through the understand scope, assessing the data, trying to make meaning of the chaos below. But in addition to that, what is really important and what I think Lonergan adds to the situation is uh, there's a second understand scope. This is us reflecting on our own ability to understand, um, where we uh, understand ourselves as knowers, as people who can uh, rationally uh, reasonably and intelligently and be attentive to the data, ask intelligent questions, arrive at answers uh, and conclusions uh, in a reasonable manner. But then the question is, what do we do with that? Knowledge and understanding. Um, and to finish with, with Lonergan, um, I think Jeff was making this point as well. It's not just what goes on in our heads that is going to be significant. Uh, and our education system at the moment is focused way too much on our heads, not enough on our hearts. So Lonigan says, and I quote this in the paper, no less than knowledge and skills, there is a development of feelings. It's true, of course, that fundamentally feelings are spontaneous. They do not lie under the command of decision as to the motions of our hands. But once they have arisen, they may be reinforced by advertence and approval and they may be curtailed by disapproval and distraction. Such reinforcement and curtailment not only will encourage some feelings and discourage others, but also modify one's spontaneous scale of preferences. Again, feelings are enriched and refined by attentive study to the wealth and variety of the objects that arouse them. And no small part of education lies in fostering and developing a climate of discernment and taste of discriminating praise and carefully worded disapproval they will conspire with the pupils or students' own capacities and tendencies, enlarge and deepen his apprehension of values and help him towards self-transcendence. So um, I think what I, I suppose like, this sums it up for me as well. 
having understood the society in which we're living, having, under, having understood our place uh, in it uh, through, uh, through reflection, um, what do we do? And our mission is to, to bring love to that world. Uh, and I think this is the task not only of Catholic education, but all education. I shall stop there. And um, as I said, a series of unconnected or loosely connected questions, observations, provocations, um, and uh, really hoping that we can have a broad discussion about whether th the things that I've been pointing to in terms of we need to pay attention to what's happening in the world of artificial intelligence, uh, have I got that right or um, am I going down my own rabbit hole there? Okay, thanks.